In this video, I want to talk about how we would go about estimating nonlinear discrete choice models. So the idea here is that we have a dependent variable y, which is discrete, so it might be a binary dependent variable. And we have talked about how we should then take a nonlinear transformation of our independent variable. So we use this function f, where f could be, let's say, a logic or a probit model. And we say it's a function of alpha plus beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2 all the way through to beta p times xp. And if we were sort of thinking about this in one particular way, we might suppose that this combination of independent variables, and also when I take the transform of that, doesn't necessarily accurately capture exactly what is going on in Y. So perhaps what we do is we include an error term epsilon. So if we were thinking about this in the same way as least squares, then what we might do then is we might try and minimize the sum of the estimated errors. So then what we would do is we would minimize the sum across all i of epsilon i all squared. Well, what would epsilon i or square be in this context? It would be, well, if I just write the sum there, we would have a bracket which would be yi minus, now capital F, alpha plus beta 1 x1i, where the i here is indicating for each individual in our sample, plus beta 2 times x2i, all the way through to beta p times xpi and then closing the parenthesis. And then what I would need to do is I would need to square this term in the parenthesis here. Okay, so it's no different thus far really to ordinary least squares. The only difference being that we have this f here in ordinary least squares is completely absent. It's just this yi minus alpha plus, or minus alpha minus beta one times x one i, etc. But because we have this f here, that is going to change our first order condition slightly. So if we were looking to estimate the parameters alpha through beta p, what we would need to do is we would need to look at the differential of s with respect to that particular parameter. So if we were looking to estimate beta 1, what we would do is we would differentiate this expression with respect to beta 1. And really what we should do is we should be looking at the estimated errors and we should be looking at the estimated parameters because we don't know these. So we would differentiate with respect to our estimate of beta 1, which we call beta 1 hat. And if we do that, we're going to get a minus 2. We get the 2 because we're differentiating this whole term in the parenthesis, which is squared. And we get a minus because we've got a minus sign here. And then we would get the sum across i of we'd have x, 1i, we'd get that because if we differentiate this term in parenthesis, we get just an x, 1i from that. But also, when you def differentiate this whole thing, including the capital F, we're going to be left with a small f, where the small f indicates the differential of big F of this whole term in parenthesis. So it's going to be alpha hat plus beta 1 hat times x, 1i, all the way through to beta p hat times x p i. And then finally, we're going to be left with the whole thing in the parenthesis, which is just y i minus capital F of everything which we've got thus far. And what we would be doing is we'd be setting this whole term equal to zero. And note that unlike the case of ordinary least squares, it's not necessarily going to be the case that we're going to get a closed form solution for beta 1 hat. And it's not necessarily going to be the case because it's just a lot more complicated. And we're going to have p of these quite complicated first order conditions. And so we're, what we're actually going to have to do is we're going to have to do some sort of numeric search to try and get the parameters beta 1 through beta p, which get as close to as possible these first order conditions being equal to zero. And when you do this sort of procedure, it is what is known as nonlinear least squares. And it's nonlinear for obvious reasons because of the fact that we have a nonlinear transformation of our independent variables. And 
although computationally it can be done this, it's in general perhaps a slightly messy way of looking at this type of system. And this kind of motivates the introduction of a type of estimation strategy which is known as maximum likelihood. So the idea with maximum likelihood, I'm not going to go into it in detail now because that's what we're going to talk about in the next few videos, is that we have a population and we have a sample from that population. And for each observation in our sample, we can sort of think about the probability that our independent variable was equal to that particular value in the sample. So we've got here the probability that yi, that particular observation, is equal to the value which it actually equals in reality. So that this is the probability that our model says that the dependent variable is actually equal to its true value. And if we write this, then we can write it in general as some sort of function of our independent variables. Uh, it's actually going to be a little bit more complicated than this, but I don't want that to cloud our sort of thinking now. So you can think about this p here as representing the probability that our independent variables predict the true value for the dependent variable. Okay, so we've got this probability value and that's for one individual in our sample. Imagine that we had two individuals in our sample. So we had two individuals. Then you could sort of think about the probability that the two individuals in our sample actually were pr predicted correctly in terms of their dependent variable as being equal to P1 times P2, assuming that they were independent. So this P here represents the probability that we would have got our observations if the population was actually determined by our F here, which we've specified. So the idea with maximum likelihood estimation, if we're just sort of thinking about having a sample of N or individuals, then we would have P1 times P2 all the way through Pn, and this would represent the probability that we would have got those individuals in our sample if our model was, or if the population model was specified by F. And the idea with maximum likelihood estimation is that we are going to choose the parameters, typically alpha hat, beta 1 hat through beta p hat, which maximize the probability that we would have got this sample of observations from a population which was specified by the process which we've given. So the idea is that we are choosing our parameters to maximize the likelihood that we would have got this sample of individuals. And that's why it's called maximum likelihood estimation. And it's a completely different way of thinking about things to that which is determined by least squares. And because of that, we're going to talk about it in depth. And then we're going to come back to discuss the logit and probit models in more depth.